this is Talk of the Nation. I'm Neil Conan in Washington. Through most of recorded history, Western nations have enjoyed military dominance over the rest of the world. Western forces have certainly lost battles, but very few wars. Small Western armies have repeatedly found themselves outnumbered, far from home, sometimes even outgunned, and they won anyway. The facts seem indisputable. The question, and it's an uncomfortable one, is why? Today, we hear from two men who have asked themselves that question, and they've arrived at very different answers. Jared Diamond is the author of Guns, Germs, and Steel. The book won a Pulitzer Prize in 1998. In it, Professor Diamond argues that the dominance of the West is not based on racial superiority, but on environment and geography. Different locations around the world produced different kinds of animals and plants, which enabled certain groups of people to develop faster than others. Jared Diamond joins us on the phone from Los Angeles, and welcome. Thank you. Good to be with you. Victor Davis Hansen is an historian and an author. His most recent book is Carnage and Culture, Landmark Battles and the Rise of Western Power. He's a professor of classics at the University of California, Fresno. His view is that culture is the driving force behind Western dominance, that Western societies, beginning with Greece, derived profound advantages from individualism, from capitalism, and from ruthlessly efficient infantry. Professor Hansen joins us from the studios of KMJ Radio in Fresno, California, and thank you for being with us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And we'd like you to join us as well by calling 800-989-TALK. That's 800-989-8255. You may want to listen a bit before you call so you can give us your reactions. And let me begin uh, by asking, uh, both of you have written uh, long and, and, and dense books on this subject. Uh, did I summarize your points of view accurately, uh, Professor Diamond? Um, yes, the only qualification I would make is from my point of view has to do with the long-term determinants, which are geographic, but of course in the short run, which can be a thousand, two thousand years, individuals and cultures can make a big difference. And uh, Professor Hansen? Yes, I think you give a pretty accurate description of what I wrote about. Good. Um, so is there, as, as uh, uh, Professor uh, Diamond was saying, Professor Hansen, uh, to some degree I, I thought your book was, uh, in a way, a rebuttal to his? I think it is. I think that I would agree that in ultimate um, factors that the Eurasian uh, nexus has some advantages. But that doesn't explain why this m miraculous discovery of Western civilization in the inland valleys of Greece 2,500 years ago, in that sense, it had almost the ideal, identical geography of Spain or the Rhone Valley or parts, other parts of southern Europe, which had nothing, no comparable idea of freedom or constitutional government, open markets. And I must say that we can see this very, very clearly in the case of Greece. Under the Mycenaeans from 1600 to 1200, it was autocratic, theocratic. It had the same language as the later city-state Greeks, but it was a vastly different culture. It was not dynamic. It did not project power much beyond Greece. And yet, the same locale, uh, same weather, same language, suddenly in the small, very underpopulated valleys of Greece in 700, you get this society where in the individual, where we have a different type of literacy, and the world is uh, taken aware of by it very quickly. Professor Diamond, uh, you have uh, wrote a lot about the advantages that uh, the first farmers uh, got from developing the first farming abilities, yet uh, those societies uh, that we think about in Mesopotamia and I guess in, in parts of China and in, uh, and in Egypt, uh, they did not rise to world dominance despite that head start. That's right. That was, that was an interesting question, why the differences within Eurasia. Given the great advantages of the Eurasian continent as the largest continent with the greatest variety of valuable domesticable plants and animals, why was it, as you say, that the societies that started it all, those of the Fertile Crescent, were not the ones to dominate the world? And basically, uh, in one sentence, it's because the societies of the Fertile Crescent had the misfortune to be in the, a fragile environment and ended up committing ecological suicide. You can see that today from the fact that Iraq used to be the center of world agriculture, and to say that today would be a bad joke. That's the result of 10,000 years of overgrazing by sheep um, and human impacts in a dry environment. And the, the facts of, of geography there, the, the wide, flat plains, uh, the, the need for uh, uh, the kind of agriculture that was, uh, that was first learned there uh, leads to also a, a certain kind of government, does it not? 
it certainly leads to a the origin of state and then empire governments starting out from tribal government, where you get lots of people settling down um, in villages because of productive agriculture. Then you get a gradual evolution from band and tribal societies to states and empires, and that's why the first chiefdoms and states and then the first empires arose in the Fertile Crescent and then subsequently in Egypt because of their early productive agriculture. And, uh, Professor Hansen, uh, let's turn back to you. Uh, once these uh, aggressive societies, these competitive societies, the, the city-states of Greece e evolved, or emerged, rather, um, they were able to um, overwhelmingly defeat the forces of these great empires uh, from the Fertile Crescent. Yes, they were. What's peculiar to Western culture, it has the ability to trump or to override geography. And in the case of uh, Egypt, for example, or the Near East, Egypt's a very good example because by Persian times in the 6th century, you could make the argument that the pharaohs had exhausted the soil and there was a lot of ecological damage. But once Alexander came in and then the whole legacy of Hellenistic culture arrived into Egypt, what did the Greeks do? Immediately they moved the capital from Karnak to Alexandria. They brought in rational science discussion, a highly literate society, and a very different way of farming. And suddenly, what had been an exhausted uh, landscape that had ruined the pharaonic Egypt became the wealthiest part of the Mediterranean. But it was because of a different cultural approach to the same geography. And Professor Diamond, uh, do you find that a, a compelling argument? Well, partly, and let me give you modern parallels uh, um, in agreement with Professor Hansen's point that culture does make a difference, certainly in the short run. Look at North and South Korea today, or East and West Germany 15 years ago. There was basically the same geography, different halves of the same country, yet because of different systems, um, one got very different economic power. So, yeah, in the short run, certainly... Um, uh, culture does make a difference. There were uh, societies and places on the planet uh, that would seem to have had uh, many of the same kinds of advantages, and you certainly have to think of China in, in that regard. Uh, farming began there early, uh, as early as, as anywhere else, as far as anybody can figure out. Why has not China developed the same kind of, of globe-girdling power uh, as the European powers? That's a very interesting uh, question. It's one that I considered briefly at the end of my book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. And while people often cite cultural reasons behind the recent changes in China, such as Confucianism supposedly being incompatible with science and the mercantile system, the fact is that Confucian China had a huge lead over backwater Europe until something like 1400. I made a brief argument that subsequently has been developed by Graham Lang and other Chinese specialists. And the basic argument is a geographic argument. Um, why is it that China became a centralized state where inventors could not move across the border if they did not get supported by the empire? It's the geography of China. The main rivers of China run parallel, unlike the radial rivers of Europe. China does not have all those peninsulas, like the Greek and Iberian Peninsula that Professor Hansen mentioned, each of which became independent countries. And China does not have transecting um, mountain ranges or major islands like Britain. So for all these reasons, China got unified 221 BC. It's been unified most of the time since then, whereas Europe has been fragmented and still fragmented today. But fragmentation, 2,000 countries, means 2,000 different experiments. Hmm. Uh, Professor Hansen? Uh, well, it's an odd argument because usually scholars have suggested that the disunity and the fragmentation of Europe resulted in endless war and sapped the vitality. But if that were to be true, remember Rome had an empire for about seven, uh, not an empire, but a republic for 200 years that was prominent in the Mediterranean, then an empire for 500 years. And the Mediterranean was a highway between Africa, Asia, and Europe, so it was a, a great advantage to Europe to be unified through the Mediterranean. It was very, you could go from one end to the other in two weeks, but the difference, that would explain why Rome was powerful in the same way the geography would explain why, why China was. But the great difference between the two is that Rome, following the classical tradition that started in Greece, never achieved the same level of 
coercion as far as ideas and rational thinking, either through religion or for government. There was never, knowledge was never confined uh, among a small elite. Writing was, an, an, when mixed with capitalism, fostered innovation and profit making. You can see that in Petronius' Satyricon, where people all over the empire come together and try to outbid each other, outthink each other. And the emperors and the Roman religion, what even Christianity, didn't have the degree that was found in China to stifle ideas. Our telephone that was an input. Yes, I'm sorry. Our telephone number is 800-989-8255. That's 800-989-TALK. Or you can send us an email, TOTN at NPR dot O-R-G. And, and let's go to the phones. And our first caller is Jim, who's on the line from Portland, Oregon. Hi. Uh, this is a very interesting subject. Uh, I've been studying military history all my life. Um, went through uh, the Vietnam conflict. And what I've learned is it has absolutely nothing to do with the, the premises that your authors seem to be making. What my experience has been is it is strictly leadership. Um, whether you look at Mao Zedong or Genghis Khan or um, uh, you know Caesar, Julius Caesar. I mean, you can look at every single race of people. You can look at every single um, uh, country, whether, whether it's Japan, China, America, England. I mean, it has everything to do with what type of leadership they had at that time. Why is it that you look at Napoleon? Napoleon was able to take the French army and virtually, you know, uh, conquer the world with it. And yet, um, the, you know, a few century, you know, a few decades later, in 1870, they get they, they just get stomped on by the Prussians. Um, and you look at the Great Sepoy Rebellion in, in May of 1854, you look at uh, how millions of Indians attacked a relatively few thousand British soldiers and initially wiped out uh, many of them. But when they came back with a few thousand British soldiers, they were able to just absolutely decimate and, and take over this nation with just a few thousand people. Well, Jim... And, Let's see if we can get an answer. I think uh, Vic Victor Davis Hanson is the military historian in this crowd. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there's criteria in every battle that defines yeah. success. Some of them are military leadership, some is numbers, some are logistics, some is accident, a bad day, bad weather. But mm -hmm. what happens in Western culture is there's a margin of error that other cultures don't have when they go to war. That means that their organization, a very different idea of discipline. That's why the British also won not only in the Sepoy Revolt but against the Zulus. They have a margin of error where they really don't need brilliant leaders when they're fighting the non-West because they bring to the, to the battlefield some cultural assumptions about arms, technology, rationalism, discipline, organization, and leadership, which is the often... The individual initiative of the soldiers helped a lot. Exactly, and that's a good I mean, point. You can see that at the Battle of Midway where... Japanese soldiers were highly uh, well-armed, they were highly disciplined in the Japanese tradition, but they didn't have the level of individualism that the Americans did. And that's why the Yorktown was repaired in 70, 72 hours before the battle, because of individualism on the part of uh, welders, electricians, and the Japanese carriers at, York, at uh, Coral Sea that were damaged sat there waiting for a bu bureaucratic directive. Same thing with code breaking at Midway. There was a bunch of long-haired academics um, in Hawaii that were given freedom and on following the Western tradition of give and take, crack the Japanese codes. That would not have been possible in the Japanese army. It's not that, that these things always predominate because the West does lose, but it means that on any given day, Western leaders have a margin of error that their adversaries don't. Jim, thank the Japanese. Uh, the Japanese. Thank Jim, I, I'm, a, I'm afraid we're, we're running out of time in this segment. Thanks very much, though, for your call. We're talking about how the West has won in this segment. Send us an email. Our address is TOTN at NPR.org or give us a telephone call, 800 989 TALK. I'm Neil Conan. This is Talk of the Nation from NPR News. This is Talk of the Nation. I'm Neil Conan in Washington. This hour, we're talking about the forces that made the West dominant in technology and in military affairs. Our guests are Jared Diamond, the author of Guns, Germs, and Steel, and Victor Davis Hanson, historian and author of Carnage and Culture, Landmark Battles in the Rise of Western Power. And we'd like to invite you to join the discussion. Our telephone number, 800-989-TALK, 800-989-8255. Our email address is TOTN at NPR.org. 
And I wanted to ask you both for, to talk for a moment about uh, how your backgrounds and how you arrived a at your theories. And, and Jared Diamond, you write a, a fascinating introduction to your book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, about your background in, in New Guinea and, and, and studying uh, as a scientist and studying, among other things, birds. That's right. My background in New Guinea was that I went out to New Guinea in 1964 to study birds, knowing that New Guineans are what are called primitive people, which means that they were using stone tools, they didn't have riding, um, they didn't have much in the way of clothing, and they didn't have chief states or empires. I went out there naive, figuring that these people were primitive in their technology because they were primitive in their minds, primitive mentally, the usual naive racist preconceptions. And it took me literally about one day in New Guinea to discover that these are really smart people, at least as curious and engaged and intelligent as my American and Japanese and European friends. So what was the reason why these smart people ended up with stone tools? The question arose for me in 1964, and I gradually realized, took me about 25 years to realize it, that it had to do not with differences between the people, but everything to do with differences between the environments, namely that New Guinea um, had no domesticable animals and few domesticable plants, and the same difference applies when you compare the Eurasian continent versus either Africa or the New World, though to a lesser degree, that Eurasia was just much richer in domesticable plants and animals, larger continents, so Eurasia got a huge head start of thousands of years over even Africa, North America, and South America in getting people to settle down in villages, live in complex societies, and develop all those powerful weapons that ended up winning the Battle of Midway in the Napoleonic Wars. And Victor Davis Hanson, your background, uh, grew up uh, on a farm in North California and uh, as a professor of classics. Yes, I was a classical philologist, and I was struck as I began to study military history that most of the usual explanations for the rise of the West were not, I didn't find all that convincing either that it was a late development of the Industrial Revolution because I knew the legacy of Greece or it was because of gunpowder, which I knew was also late, and are, are they, to be frank, the geographical explanations. And so I, over the years, I've been, I began to look at battles in a very um, detailed way, and I came to the conclusion that there was a tradition that began with Hellenism, and before that tradition, that is before 2,500 years, the embryo where that arose was a very primitive country. It was underpopulated. Uh, it had no navigable rivers. It had very low population densities. It had no uh, cultural, uh, I didn't feel it had a very rich cultural tradition before it. The Mycenaeans had been completely wiped out. And while the Greeks had borrowed uh, things from other peoples, both in art and an alphabet, what they did to them was quite unique. And then I, so for, to me, the rise of Western military power meant that it, uh, it was a gift, an accidental gift perhaps, had nothing to do with genes or anything. It was just the miracle of the human experience in Greece. And that also meant that uh, the usual explanations I found that when the, the West was weak, for example, in the Dark Ages or during the medieval period or even during the Renaissance, you, you still see that Europe is pretty much pristine and projecting military power, whether it's the Crusades or a divided uh, Europe between Orthodoxy, Protestantism, and Catholicism still holding the Ottomans at bay. So it seemed to me a very dynamic tradition, but it, I couldn't trace it anywhere before uh, the seventh century in Greece. Let's go back to the phones again. Our number, 800-989-8255. Our next caller is Todd, who's on the line with us from Cleveland. Hi. Uh, I'm actually an instructor in modern world history at a college here. Uh, I'm a graduate student in U.S. history. But um, what I wanted to point out is that uh, to claim uh, this so-called Western tradition is very much a 19th century uh, tradition of claiming Greece. And I think even just in the lead-in to present uh, history as 2,500 years of unbroken so-called Western uh, domination is kind of inaccurate. I mean, we need to remember uh, the Arab Empire that pre preserved Greek and uh, Roman wisdom while Europe was in the so-called Dark Ages. Uh, there's a reason why we've been shifting to world history away from traditional uh, Western civilization courses. There's a lot of problems with just considering this as one uh, tradition, one rubric uh, that's unbroken. Uh, it's, there's very little of Europe that 
uh, geographically that consisted of the Greek or Roman empires, actually, just the southern fringe of the Mediterranean. Uh, there's, there have been historians who have noted links to Africa, um, especially to Egypt, like Berdal. Uh, there have been historians who have argued that the, the reason that Europeans set off in uh, looking for conquest power goods was because they were, co they were economically uh, poor in relation to China. China had no need to go uh, voyaging around the globe in search of um, uh, any kind of manufactured products. I mean, Europe's chief export uh, in like in like uh, 14, 1500 was wool. So I just wanted to see how the professors um, would uh, consider that premise. Well, Victor Hansen, uh, some of that seems to be directed at you. Yes, it does. <laughs> Well, I mean, nobody would deny that there's a cross-fertilization across the Mediterranean. There was great cultural achievements of every um, uh, Islam, the Ottomans, Africa. But what's unique is that the Greeks and Western tradition, as we de uh, define it in the classical tradition, is anti-Mediterranean. Almost every idea from local control to private property to constitutional law to consent of the governed to rational tradition is a Western idea. So it is unique, and what's interesting about world history is how that allows a very small people in a very small land to achieve power that's not commiserate otherwise. But as far as Islam, there are they have been great Islamic uh, mathematicians, but the question is, why is it that their genius was not disseminated in a wide fashion to the population? In the 16th century, uh, Spanish and Swiss ballistics manuals uh, don't re uh, uh, don't reflect a higher degree of knowledge than what was going on in the Islamic world, but they do uh, reach far more people because of the marriage between rationalism and capitalism in a way that Islam is not. Every time an Islamic scientist had a brilliant idea, he found himself isolated either by a government coercion or uh, reactions from Islamic fundamentalism. So his ideas... Were, remained among a small Mandarin elite in a way that was somewhat true of China as well. But it's somewhat deterministic to assume that uh, the so-called West, as in European, the European intellectual establishment or governments, were interested in disseminating knowledge to the people. I mean, one theory is that that occurred as a result of the Reformation, which was somewhat of a social movement, uh, spread literacy and kind of took on a life of its own. It, some of this knowledge wasn't intended to get out to the population. I guess I'm just... Oh, excuse me, I, I, uh, that's not quite correct because th there was literacy at 30 to 40 or 50 percent in classical antiquity. It's not, that's not the proper historical question, I'm, I'm just why it's intended. It's not concerned. intended to help anybody, it's just insidious. I'm just concerned that this has become somewhat deterministic, that the West always has dominated and by implication always will dominate, and um, I'll end here and take your comments off the air. Okay, thank, thanks very much for your call, Todd. And uh, I, I wondered if you wanted to get in on that, Jared Diamond. Sure, I, I would make some, some comments. I think the, the caller's basic point has to do with seeing Europe in a wider context. Um, it's an approach in history associated with a movement called world history today, um, with which I'm quite sympathetic. Just to get some perspective on history, because the field of history, um, as we know it today, arose professionally in the 19th century, at the time when nation states were being formed. History has traditionally been pursued by people whose specialty is one place for one century. So the job ads in the history journals read for a 19th century French historian and a 16th century Dutch historian. The problem is that you can't understand even a small area for a small time without a larger context. For example, if what you care about is 19th century France, you can't understand 19th century France without knowing why it was different from 16th century France or without knowing why France um, at that time was different from, say, Italy at that time. To go back, for example, to the point that Professor Hansen raised at the beginning, this very interesting point about the difference between the histories of Greece and Spain, two really salient long-term points there, which you get as soon as you look at a map, is that the coast of Greece is highly indented, and the coast of Spain, of the Iberian Peninsula, is not, and that Greece lies immediately adjacent to Asia Minor, where Spain lies as far as possible. And the result is that all of those interesting things that arose in the Fertile Crescent, including writing systems, arrived in Europe first in Greece, 7,000 B.C. agriculture, and the, the, the last place they arrived was Spain. Did you, I'm sorry, I just could, couldn't hear. Did you say writing systems or riding systems, oh, like horses? 
both, actually. Okay. Horses first, about 4,000 B.C., and then riding systems, the writing, yes. um, as, as you write on paper nowadays. The first writing arrived in Greece something like, it's attested, 1800 B.C., but writing arose in the Fertile Crescent, 3400 B.C., and all that the Greeks did was to add vowels to writing systems that had been preformed to the east. So that shows how the perspective of world history that our caller raised really is an essential perspective. Okay. Uh, let's go on to uh, another call, and now A.J. joins us on the line from Concord, New Hampshire. Hello. Uh, I, I've got a question I'd like to pose to either one of your guests. Um, and it pertains to China, which you were talking about a couple of minutes back, mm -hmm. was the failure of China to rise to, you know, the stratospheric levels of the Indo-European, Indo-Aryan peoples in, in, world, uh, in world affairs and world dominance. Was that attributable, do you think, to China's decision at, at a certain point in its history leading up to the Opium War with the British do you think that was attributable to their decision to cut off from the rest of the world, turn their backs to the rest of the world, look inwards, and become the Middle Kingdom? I could comment on that because it began much earlier. It's, it's not China's turning inwards at the time of the Opium Wars. Just to get a perspective on this, remember that until 1400, China led the world, including Europe, in almost everything essential. China had by far the biggest, most numerous, and best ships. China had invented gunpowder, paper, printing, compasses, kites, deep ocean, deep drilling, and all that other stuff. So the real question is why China began to lose its enormous lead, and that began in the 1400s. China was sending out fleets that, um, of ships that sailed to India, Arabia, east coast of Africa, and looked as if 1432, as if China was on the verge of rounding the Cape and then colonizing and conquering Africa and Europe from the east, but it didn't happen. So China began to turn inwards in the 1400s as a result of an accident of its unity. There were a series of emperors. Eventually there came an emperor who said, we've had enough of these fleets, waste of money, let's close down the fleets. That's happened in the history of um, European countries and the United States, but in China, because there was only one emperor instead of the hundreds of princes in Europe, when the emperor decided to close down the fleets, a Chinese Columbus had no chance, whereas in Europe, when Columbus got no support in Italy or France or Portugal or three different dukes of Spain, Columbus eventually on his seventh try got support, and that is a metaphor for why Europe overtook China. You're listening. Like to, just a sec. You're listening to Talk okay. of the Nation from NPR News. Go ahead, Victor. I would just like to say that this idea that history starts in Europe as a Eurocentric product of the nation states fallacious. The, no historical tradition has been as interested in the other as the West. Whether you can go back to Herodotus and read him, what is really insular is Chinese history and Arabic historians. They seem to not be as interested in the West as the West is in them. As far as Spain, well, we could go very close and say Italy. It has indented coastline. It has major islands. Yet in 700 B.C., Italy was a backward country. And then as far as Greece, all of that cultural tradition in some sense was obliterated. So by 700 B.C., it had no advantages whatsoever. It was inward. It was a subject to nomadic invasions from the north. It was next to an empire of 70 million that wanted to destroy it. And yet this curious culture sort of came out of nowhere. And finally, about China, I think it starts much earlier, and it gets back to this idea that there is not the same tradition of dissent and open discussion in the West that the Western did. You can look at a military manual, let's say 400 B.C., brilliant one by Sun Tzu, in some ways more brilliant than anything published in the West. But if we look at a Western military tradition, a uh, tactician, for example, same time, Aeneas Tacticus, Sun Tzu says, if you want to discover how to fight, you must know the hot and the cold, the yin and the yang. Aeneas Tacticus says, if you want to take a city, you go under, over, or through, and this is how you do it. And so Western uh, knowledge and rationalism is much more amoral. It's not embedded with philosophical discussion, religious questions, but it's much more uh, dependent on answering the particular question that's posed and then disseminating the knowledge and being rewarded for it. Is there an example? An is there an example you could cite? Uh, 
an instance well, Greek, in, through history. Go ahead. Yes, of Greek literature, for example, where Greek literature, whether it's scientific literature or medical literature, philosophical literature, is spontaneous, flexible, it's controlled by individuals. The government and religion does not have the same degree of dictating text, whether it's poetry like Gilgamesh or whether it's the Egyptian Book of the Dead or whether it's even treatises from China. And that's allowed the West not to bring into the discussion questions as much of morality or of uh, restrictions on economic activity because well, the a chief... A related point uh, that I, I think is worth mentioning is that uh, you, you were talking about the art of war just a second back. Now, in ancient Greece, you had a fighting style called the hoplite phalanx, which was used to great effect against the Persians at Thermopylae, uh, and Persians had a clearly superior force. Do you feel then that something in Western military science is that it's more malleable, that it's more fluid, Absolutely, hence that's enabled the West to dominate. Absolutely. It's not only its command is more flexible, it has civilians that take a greater role in military operations, and most importantly, it brings weapons that are uh, that are, tend to be more sophisticated. While the West did not invent gunpowder, they stole it, and within 100 years, Japanese firearms were obsolete and irrelevant. One other thing is Western armies have a very different idea of discipline. It goes back to the classical tradition that discipline is defined by keeping in rank, fi firing or advancing in, in unison, um, drill, and protecting the man at your side. And it's not quite the same as other traditions in the New World among the Aztecs or the Incas or the Zulu. And that allows a small, cohesive force to concentrate their advance or their firepower to a much greater effect than other military traditions. Again, this has nothing to do with morality or it doesn't have anything to do with genes at all. It's just a tradition that comes out of that mystery of the 8th century in Greece that tends to allow Europe advantages that other societies don't have. And then, of course, when other societies adopt Western culture, whether it's Japan or South Korea or parts of the Ottoman Empire, then they tend to have uh, much more dynamic militaries. Well, there is the myth that... Hey, AJ, uh, we're going to have to... Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut you off there. Thank you. Thanks so much for your question. We're talking this hour about Western civilization and why it has dominated most of the rest of the world. You can continue this conversation online. Go to npr.org, click on the discussion section, then scroll down to Talk of the Nation. I'm Neil Conan, and this is Talk of the Nation from NPR News. This is Talk of the Nation. I'm Neil Conan in Washington. Today, we'll be talking about the dominance of Western military power. My guests are Jared Diamond. He's the author of Guns, Germs, and Steel, and Victor Davis Hanson, historian and author of Carnage and Culture, Landmark Battles in the Rise of Western Power. To join the conversation, give us a call, 800-989-TALK, or send us an email, TOTN at NPR.org. And our next caller is uh, Mike, who's on the line from Jackson, Wyoming. Hey, uh, Mr. Diamond. Awesome book. I tell everybody to read that. Great book. Um, what I gathered from uh, reading was that Western civilization had, like, most of the countries had four seasons, and that they had to utilize, um, you know, making shoes, building tools, and had to be a little more resourceful to deal with the four seasons. Did I uh, get the right summary off that? <laughs> well... Uh, that's a question that has been raised and that I wondered at the beginning of my research. Um, might it be the case that, as you say, the four seasons, um, the, diff the changing climates um, in Europe were a spur to European innovation? Um, the argument, unfortunately, cuts two ways. That when you look around the world, when you look at world history, it's not the case that innovation began in northern Europe and gradually spread south. It was the reverse that innovation began in the south and spread, um, spread north. Within Eurasia, um, development stemmed from lower latitudes, from the Fertile Crescent, gradually spread to the north. It's not the, also, if you look at other continents here in, in the Americas, in North and South America, it's not the case that Canada and Argentina took the lead in Native American history. The lead instead was taken near the equator, the Maya in the Yucatan, and then uh, people in Peru in, in the Amazon, and then developments then spread to higher latitudes. So this initial idea that historians often express that maybe there's something about high latitudes that stimulates innovation, it just didn't work that way. It worked the reverse way. 
Mike, okay. thanks very much. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay. Now let's go to um, uh, Lou Ann, who's on the line from Glenside, Pennsylvania. Thank you, Neil. Hello. Hi. Uh, first, Hi. I'm calling nationally. It's a, it, and the most amazing subject that you're on today. It's something that I've pondered personally uh, for many years, and but uh, most especially in uh, particularly dealing with Africa. And I haven't uh, heard you make much reference to African nations. And, you know, so I'm wondering what your two professors and with their different theses could could uh, comment in terms of African cultures and societies as to why so much superiority in the West, mm-hmm. technologically, culturally, to Western nations. Yeah, well, since, since humans developed there first, you'd think they would have had the biggest head start of all. And, uh, right, exactly. We came out of Africa, and w- what happened since? Yeah, exactly. mm-hmm. what, what did happen? Right. Yeah. I had a whole chapter in my book on Africa, and in fact, insofar as there was a eureka moment for me in working on my book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, it was when I came to grips with the history of Africa. As you say, Africa had a huge head start. That's where modern humans evolved. So why did Africa lose that head start? couple of reasons. Um, a major reason is that Africa, south of the Sahara, had no domesticable animals. All those big animals of Africa that the tourists go to Africa to see, rhinoceroses, hippopotamuses, lions, they've never been domesticated. Instead, the rise of productive agricultural societies in Africa awaited the arrival of cows, sheep, goats, and in West Africa, horses, from the north, from Eurasia. So that was a big problem with Africa. And the other big problem with Africa is its axis. Africa runs north-south. It's longer from north to south and east to west. Same is true about North America and South America, but Eurasia runs from east to west, long axis east to west. Um, Professor Diamond, aren't there water buffalo in Africa? There were no. The water buffalo that was domesticated was domesticated in China. The buffalo of Africa is the nastiest animal alive. Ah. It's never been domesticated. If you want to walk up to it, that's a good way to commit suicide. Okay, I'll avoid that. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. Um, uh, Professor Hansen? Well, I mean, if we look at the countries in Africa that have been able to project military power, it's countries that came from the West, whether it was the British in Zululand or in South Africa or in Rhodesia, it's, not again, not a moral question, but when they bring a particular tradition to Africa, that Africa, and the question is, where did that tradition come from? And we're sort of get back to the chicken and the egg. Again, I would argue that uh, there's not much to recommend uh, culture in Greece other than that gives it any other advantage in any country in its immediate proximity, and yet most of the European miracle comes out of that tradition. My ancestors in Sweden, people in England, people in central Germany, had uh, no, I mean, they had some advantages that Professor Diamond has pointed out, but if they had not inherited the classical tradition, which they didn't really inherit from the Etruscans or from the French or from the Spanish or from other Mediterranean peoples, they would have been as backward as anybody in Africa. In fact, they were, if we can read uh, Tacitus or Caesar about indigenous tribes in Europe. Well, thanks for the call, Luann. Thank you, Neil. Okay. Bye-bye. And let's go now to Portia, who's calling from Bar Harbor in Maine. Hi, yes. Um, I have one big question, (laughs) and it seems to me, it's a comment slash question, I guess, um, that you guys presume that the West has won um, global dominance because it has it now, whereas it seems to me that in the past, different countries and empires have had um, as much dominance as we have over the world that they were able to be in contact with. And I'm just wondering... um, if you think that we're in a stasis point now and that just because for the past thousand years or so the West has had control for 1,500 years that we will have it forever or if you don't think that other cultures may rise and take that from us. Victor Hansen. I I would say that it's not, we have to get away sort of this idea of the West. It's the West is just simply the inheritors of a paradigm. Whatever culture seems to want to adapt personal freedom and open markets and constitutional government respect for individualism and a chauvinism of a middle class so it's not a society of two classes will be dominant because that's that's what humans aspire to to be free and to be secure and to be prosperous and that can be in japan we can see it now in china 
We can see it in parts of the Soviet Union. So it's not necessarily that Europe and America are ganging up on anybody. It's simply that they had a paradigm that they inherited that gives what most humans want. And any country who chooses to adopt that, whether it's South Korea and not North Korea, then they are going to, they're going to have advantages in, in terms of projecting power and influence beyond their borders. And those that don't, won't. Jared Diamond? Let me focus on the word chooses. It's not enough to choose to adopt because there are literally a hundred countries around the world that are choosing, would love to adopt um, the Western tools of success. Even today, there are countries that have huge disadvantages, um, particularly tropical countries suffer from less productive agriculture and they suffer from an enormous burden of disease and public health. And so, in fact, if you look around the world and, and compare the economies of countries around the world, by far the best predictor of wealth and power in the modern world um, is, is ecology and latitude. There are a few countries that have gotten around that, notably Singapore and Malaysia and Taiwan, by escaping the disadvantages that geography dealt them. But it's still the case that geography is a potent force in the world today, and September 11th really rubs that into our faces. Okay, can well, I, I would agree, but one more part of I, this question? Then? I'm, I'm afraid we're all going to have to leave it right there because uh, we're out of time, and that's the other part of Western civilization we may not be too pleased with. But thanks very much, Portia, for your call. Thank you. Okay. And Jared Diamond, thanks to you. You are welcome. Jared Diamond, the author of Guns, Germs, and Steel. He joined us on the phone from Los Angeles. Victor Davis Hanson, good to talk with you again. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Victor Davis Hanson, the author of Carnage and Culture, Landmark Battles in the Rise of Western Power. He joined us from the studios of KMJ Radio in Fresno, California. And you're listening to Talk of the Nation from NPR News.